Prevention really is the first step to being prepared. In this set of videos, we will not go in depth into creating a full cybersecurity plan. If you need more information on that, you should refer to our videos on creating security plans. However, there is a lot of overlap when creating an incident response plan. A big part of creating both plans is understanding what your assets are and understanding the threats and vulnerabilities that might affect those. What we are really talking about here is performing risk assessments. We cannot emphasize enough how important a good risk assessment is. Here at NCSA, we have moved to this model, and that is one of the things that's helped us focus on the preparation phase of the life cycle. What a risk assessment does for you is that it helps you document and really understand what your assets are. It's not uncommon to find that your real critical assets are different than what you thought based on performing the assessment. Along with identifying your assets, the risk assessment will also help you identify and understand the threats to your assets and the vulnerabilities in your system. When you combine your threats and vulnerabilities, you're able to determine your risk level for various assets. With the risk level, you are then able to prioritize your actions and make judgments on how best to mitigate those risks. The risk assessment ties directly into creating your security plan. It helps you identify what type of monitoring you should be doing with your system for your incident response plan. We cannot emphasize enough how important it is to perform a risk assessment. If you need help with this, please feel free to contact CTSC for help. Another important area in preparation is that of policies, particularly security and use policies. Policies guide you in what you need to protect against and how you approach those efforts. In general, they document what your assets are and what is important to your organization. You might also have to take into account a multi-level organization. Many academic units have their own policies, but the university they are part of might have another set that you need to be aware of. Also, the project you're working on might have policies that need to be considered. Creating a cybersecurity plan is a very important part of incident response. It helps to identify what systems you have and what resources make up that system. The plan should call out all the services that make up the system too. This allows you then, in the incident response plan, to identify what you are monitoring and what you are looking for. All of these items are important for dealing with incident response. If you do get hit by an attack, which inevitably you will, these items give you the process and the ability to know how to march through that and hopefully get back to a point where you are stable and running normal again. Now that we've told you how important it is to perform a risk assessment, let's give you a quick overview on how to perform it. As mentioned earlier, we have a whole series of videos on performing one. So we will be very brief here and encourage you to watch those or contact us if you need more help or information. The important part about a risk assessment is identifying your assets. It's mostly about the data, hardware, systems, and services that make up your project. It helps you identify what's important to you. One thing that is often forgotten in this assessment is reputation. While strictly speaking, reputation may not be an asset, it is often something very important that you need to protect. This identification of assets is part of the system characterization step of a risk assessment. What to watch for during this step are the items that move to the top of your list. This will help you to identify the most important assets you have and the ones you are most concerned about protecting. Another big part of the risk assessment is threat identification. Threat identification is not a one-time activity. Your security people should be constantly monitoring what is going on in the world of cybersecurity. They should be monitoring news feeds, talking to collaborators, and making every effort to understand what threats are out there. The dynamics of threats is constantly changing, and keeping on top of those changes is an important part of a security plan. Understanding the vulnerabilities of your system is another very important outcome of the risk assessment. Staying on top of information from vendors and security companies is a crucial way of staying aware of system vulnerabilities. Just like the area of threats, vulnerabilities are constantly being found and patched. 
It is also the role of your security team to determine if the vulnerability applies to you, or how it applies to you. For example, the Heartbleed vulnerability was a well published threat, but if your system was not using SSL, it might not have directly applied to you, and you would not have had to patch anything. However, there might still be security concerns that needed to be addressed. Users of your system might have been using the same logon and password from systems that had been compromised by the Heartbleed problem. This would then have left you exposed for possible attack. Many system administrators made users change passwords just to be safe. This is the type of decision your security team needs to make when constantly monitoring threats and vulnerabilities. Policies are all about documenting your rules and requirements for your system. Unfortunately for many projects, actual policies do not exist. They exist in the sense that various people have rules and requirements in their heads, but nothing is written down. Having things in writing is a very important part of both a security plan and an incident response plan. Your policies and procedures, in part, define what an incident is. For example, if there is no formal document outlining what is expected in regards to privacy expectations, how can one know if there was a breach of privacy? Also, these documents instruct staff on how to respond to incidents. It does not take a lot to write these policies down. They don't have to be 50-page documents. They do need to lay out what's important to your organization and what types of steps need to be taken to manage those. They might be things like authorized use policies, or what is and is not allowed to run on your systems. As we mentioned, a privacy policy, or even policies on how to add and remove users from your system. Along with policies you come up with for your project, there might also be existing ones for your department and university. The university will definitely have privacy policies that you'll need to be aware of and to abide by. Depending on the type of project you are, you might have to also deal with state and federal policies. This might also include things such as HIPAA and ITAR regulations that you will need to be aware of and follow. Examples of different policies would include the information classification policy defines what kind of information is stored on a system. Based on that classification, the information may need additional protections to be put in place. This is especially true as some information is protected by state and federal law or industry regulations. It's important to know your system's information classification and what risks are associated with it. Disclosure policies are very important. If you have an incident, sometimes you want to tell everyone about it and sometimes you don't want to tell anyone about it. Having a policy to guide you is very important. At many organizations, you are not allowed to talk directly to law enforcement. This type of communication needs to go through the organization's legal department. This is an important thing to be aware of, knowing what type of approval you need to talk to who and when. This policy will also instruct you on what type of reports need to be filed on an incident, who those reports should go to, and what should be included in them. Media policies. They give instructions on how to handle requests from media outlets. If someone calls you up and asks for information about your incident, what are you allowed to tell them? Are you even allowed to talk to them? These are important pieces of information to have. Most likely, there will be outside media policies you need to be aware of. Most likely, your university will have one, and any regulatory agency you might be working with. Privacy policies give guidance on what type of information you can talk about, how much you can say about individuals or data within the system. This might also go to the extent of telling you who you can talk about that was involved in the incident, or what systems or resources were affected. You really need to understand the privacy issues that affect your project. Security policies are broader than the other policies we've talked about so far. These policies tend to focus on what you can and can't do. They give instruction to administrators about what they are allowed or forbidden to do on a system. For example, can you look at emails or at various files on the system? What are you allowed to do in regards to a person's data? Those are really important questions which you need to identify 
before you start to investigate things too far. Disaster recovery policies are fairly self-explanatory. They will help you understand what types of backup or other recovery action you have available to you. That might have to do a full system restore or nothing. But it is very helpful to know before you take any action what is available to you in terms of recovering the system. Your incident response plan is part of the overall cybersecurity plan. The cybersecurity plan is meant to address the risks that your project has already identified and how you will mitigate those. There are a number of good resources available for help with putting a cybersecurity plan together. These include the video series by CTSC and also documentation from CTSC. Along with these is an excellent document from SANS on security best practices. I'll take the time to go into great detail on developing a full security plan. We will mention that if you go out and look at the SANS Best Practices Guide, that will go a long way to helping you develop your plan. If you address the risks talked about in the document, you'll have a very good start in developing a security plan for your organization. Also, CTSC is available to aid you in developing your plan or to do a review of existing policies and procedures you have. We need to emphasize monitoring and alert systems too. All the best practices talked about in the SANS document, and really all the risks you end up identifying, will have a monitoring and alert component to them, or at least they should. Obviously, this becomes critical for incident response. As you can see, there are a number of sources you should be monitoring and gathering information from. These sources play a critical role in any incident response. They will be where you get your information from during an incident and based on what you are seeing happening in them, they will guide you in how to proceed. Make sure you take the time needed to set up systems that will be able to fully monitor and gather the needed information. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, Grant number OCI 1234408.